Welcome everyone to the IMP One World Seminar, which is our, an online seminar series that's run by the International Association of Mathematical Physics. Um, in case uh, you, you didn't already know, we're always happy to welcome new members. So if you're, you aren't a member already, we encourage you to, uh, to sign on to IMP.org and, uh, and sign up. Today, we are very happy to have a, a seminar by Noe Cuneo, who's going to give us a talk about large deviations of return times and related entropy estimators on shift space. Noe, you can take it away. Okay, uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the uh, organizers for the invitation. Uh, I'm very honored to, to speak here. So I will tell you about some joint work with uh, Renaud Raquepa, who is at uh, Courant Institute. And so I will start by introducing the, uh, the setup uh, and uh, define these uh, return times and explain their uh, role as uh, entropy estimators. And then I will briefly recall some existing results about the large deviations of these uh, return times. And as we will see, there are surprisingly uh, few uh, such results uh, available. And then I will tell you about what we proved with uh, Renault, which is a complete large deviation uh, principle for these uh, return times under some uh, decoupling assumptions, which I will uh, also introduce. Uh, and as we will see, uh, in some cases, we will find a non-convex rate function. And then I will try to illustrate this with, uh, with a couple of examples and uh, try to give you some uh, ideas of the, uh, of the proof. So please don't hesitate if you, if you have questions and if there are some in, in the chats that I don't see also, please, uh, please uh, interrupt me. So the, the setup is very, uh, very simple. Uh, we work on a, on a shift space. So we just take omega here, which is the set of, uh, of uh, infinite sequences over some finite alphabet uh, A. And so we're going to denote the points of omega by, uh, by x, like this, x1, x2, and so on. Uh, and if we want to turn this into a dynamical system, then we introduce a shift map uh, T, which just shifts the, the whole sequence to the, to the left and, uh, and drops the first uh, symbol uh, x1. And so we want to, to, to consider uh, some invariance probability measures uh, P on this, uh, on this uh, set of uh, sequences. So, so in in measures that are invariant under uh, translation. Uh, we do not necessarily assume that they have full support. So if you want to think of a measure on a, on a subshift, this is uh, perfectly fine. And so P is a measure on the space of uh, infinite sequences. And uh, we will use the following notations for the, the marginals on the first uh, n symbols. We'll just call them Pn. And here we use the notation xkn. Uh, this is just a word that's made of the symbols xk to uh, xn, uh, like this. And so some examples that one might have to, to, to keep in mind for the, the talk are the following. So the simplest is the case of uh, Bernoulli measures. So that's well all, when all the symbols are uh, iid. So we just take here some product measure with, with P, uh, any, uh, any probability distribution on, on our alphabet. And what's surprising is that even in this very simple case, the, the results about return times that I will present are actually uh, new. Uh, so then one can also think of uh, Markov uh, chains, uh, where here we have some invariant uh, probability distribution pi and then some transition probabilities. And we can also think of spin chains uh, with some uh, absolutely summable interactions, uh, where here the, the, our alphabet uh, A is just uh, the different um, states that uh, each spin can can have, and um, and so one of the starting points is is going to be the celebrated uh, Shannon Macmillan uh, Breiman theorem theorem, which we will call SMB theorem. And the theorem says that uh, one can define a local entropy function, uh, HP of X, by taking minus the limit of one over N times the logarithm of the, of the marginal uh, of uh, X one N here. And that almost surely this converges. And so this defines this, uh, this function HP here, uh, which is invariant under uh, the shift map T. Uh, the integral of this, uh, of this uh, en local entropy function is just the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy of the measure P, which is defined uh, as usual as, minus, as uh, the limit of one over N times the entropy of the, um, of the Nth uh, marginal. And so in the case where the measure is, uh, is ergodic, then this function is, uh, is uh, almost surely constant and actually equal to the, uh, the entropy here, but we, we're not going to assume any, uh, any ergodicity in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. And so uh, now 
we introduced uh, return times. So if we look at an infinite sequence here, uh, we can just look at the first n symbols and uh, and ask the question, when do these first uh, n symbols reappear uh, for the first time uh, farther down the, the sequence? And then one has, one has to ask whether we, we want to allow for overlaps or not. Is, is the, the, the first reapparition of these symbols allowed to uh, overlap x1 to xn or not? And so we have two definitions. Um, I mean, two variants of the definition. The first one is Rn, and that's the one where we uh, allow for uh, overlaps. So we just take the smallest case, such that xk plus 1, xk plus n is equal to x1n. So that's the most natural definition in the context of dynamical systems. It's, it's the first time that the orbit comes back to the, to the cylinder uh, set of rank n uh, in which it, uh, it started. And so now if we do not want any overlaps, uh, then we just restrict uh, k to values larger than n, and we call this Vn. And it turns out that uh, Rn is, is kind of more interesting. It will lead to some non-convex rate functions, as, as we will see. And the Vn is a bit easier to study. So, so we will start by uh, Vn, and then we will see what changes for, uh, for Rn. And so just to, to see an example, so here, if we want to compute R3 of this, uh, this sequence here, so the first time that these three symbols here reappear is after two steps, so R3 is equal to two. Uh, but this does not count as a, as a, as a return uh, if we, for Vn, if we, uh, if we forbid overlaps. And so for Vn, we have to go look a little bit uh, farther, and it actually takes five steps to see again this 0, 1, 0. And so Rn and Vn um, disagree only when Rn is smaller than n, which is when the first return in terms of Rn uh, actually contains some, uh, some overlap. And so uh, there is a, a, a theorem, I will, I will comment on the authors in a, in a minute, which says that be almost surely, uh, if you take the, the logarithm of this return time and divide by n, then it converges uh, to uh, the, the local entropy function uh, HP of X here, uh, which means that it gives us a way to estimate this, um, this entropy. And in, this is in particular very useful when, when this entropy here is, is a number in the ergodic case. Uh, and in a way, um, the, the advantage of these estimators is that you don't need to know the, the actual, the explicit form of the, uh, of the um, of the marginals of the measure p, you can actually see your um, view your uh, measure p as a, as a black bar, as a black box, in the sense of information theory, and you just have a typical sequence, and a typical sequence is enough to compute these uh, these limits here, without any knowledge for the uh, the explicit uh, measure uh, p. So this is this is very uh, very useful, and so uh, this theorem was first proved by Wiener and Ziff. Uh, in the uh, in the ergodic case, and they they obtained some convergence in uh, in probability. Uh, then this was strengthened to uh, almost true convergence by uh, Ornstein and, and Weiss, still in the ergodic case. And then Kontoyanis uh, provided uh, another proof, still in the ergodic case, but his proof has the advantage that it is actually not too hard to to generalize to the uh, non-ergodic case. And uh, and so. Once that we have this uh, this uh, almost true convergence here, which, which we can sort of see as some law of large uh, numbers, then of course we might ask about the fluctuations. And uh, in his thesis, uh, which is uh, I mean this one, uh, Kontoyanis proved that uh, that under some strong mixing conditions, we actually have a central limit theorem, and the law of uh, iterated uh, logarithm. And, uh, and now the, the question we want to, to ask today is what about the large deviations of, uh, of these return times? And so uh, just to recall the, uh, the definition, uh, we want to say that the, uh, that the um, yeah, we want to say that the sequence yn of real valued random variables uh, satisfies the large deviation principle, LDP, if there exists a rate function i, so that's a function from r to zero infinity here, such that for any subset a of r, if you take the, uh, the the logarithm of the probability that yn belongs to a and divide by n, then the limb soup is bounded above by minus the infimum uh, over the uh, the closure of a of the rate function, and the limb inf is bounded below by minus the infimum over the interior of the uh, of the set a of the of the rate function. 
And so the usual way to think about these large deviations is to say that the probability that Yn belongs to, to some, uh, some, some small neighborhood of, uh, of uh, S decreases at the exponential case, scale like e to the minus n times i of s. So the, the larger the rate function, the, the faster the, uh, the decay at the exponential scale. And so, of course, we want to consider the case where uh, yn is equal to 1 over n times the logarithm of our return times. And very surprisingly, uh, there are very few results about that. And we know of two, uh, two such results. The first one is by colleague Alves and, uh, and Schmidt. And uh, they considered uh, the case where P is, uh, is an equilibrium measure for uh, some uh, holder continuous potential. So we don't need to worry about the exact definition uh, uh, here. What matters is that this is a standard class of uh, probability measures, but this is fairly uh, limited. And in particular, uh, it, implies, it implies that the measure P is, uh, is uh, strongly mixing, which is again quite uh, restrictive. And they were able to prove a, a local large deviation principle for Rn. And by local here, we mean that it only works when the set A here uh, is a subset of some uh, interval. You cannot get it on the, for all values of, uh, of, um, of S. And, uh, and then uh, this was improved uh, very recently by, uh, by Abadi, Amorim, Chazot, and uh, Gallo. And uh, first, they consider more general potentials, those with uh, summable variations. And then they get a local LDP on a larger interval and for both uh, variants of the return times. Uh, but again, this is, this is limited for, uh, on, some, uh, on some interval. And we will understand uh, later why this is limited to such intervals. And uh, they make the, the following conjecture. They say, we believe that there exists a non-trivial rate function describing the global large deviation, large deviation asymptotic, but this has to be proven using another method. And uh, they make no conjecture about the expression of the uh, of the rate function in the paper, uh, but we had very interesting uh, discussions uh, about that with them, and in particular with uh, Jean-René Chazot. And uh, although they did not mention it in the paper, they expected the rate function for uh, Rn to be non-convex. Uh, and so this is precisely what we do with uh, with Renault. We prove this conjecture. We prove the global large deviation principle, and we provide a formula for the the rate function, which is indeed non-convex for uh, Rn. Uh, in general, as, as we will see. And, uh, and we also proved that under some uh, decoupling conditions, which are uh, quite a bit more, uh, more general. So now I would like to introduce these decoupling assumptions, which we are going to uh, assume as of now. So we will assume that there exists a sequence Cn, which is sub-exponential. So for example, this Cn can grow uh, polynomially, such that for any word u of length n and any word v of length m, the following holds, if you take the probability of the, of the word uh, uv, then this is bounded below, uh, bounded above by cn times the probability of u times the probability of v. And, uh, and we're, we're assuming here a similar lower bound with, uh, with uh, cn minus one. So this is really a comparison with the uh, independent uh, case in a way, with this constants here, which can grow, but, uh, but sub-exponentially. And so here, the upper bound is fine, but the lower bound is, uh, is uh, not quite satisfactory. So for example, if we just pick an irreducible Markov chain uh, where not all transitions are allowed, then clearly this, this doesn't work because um, not all paths uh, U and V uh, can be glued together just, just like that. Uh, so if you take some words U and V that, that have positive probability, meaning that they correspond to, uh, to valid uh, path on the, on, the, um, on the Markov chain, and if, you, if we want to glue them together, uh, then we need to add something in between in order to go from the, uh, the end of U to the beginning of, uh, of V. So actually, we, we consider a more general uh, lower bound here, where we allow to uh, insert some, some word uh, Xi, which, uh, which helps connect U to, uh, to V. And so we allow this word Xi to depend on U and V but its length has to be bounded by some sequence tau n, which is uh, sublinear. And so this is what we're going to assume uh, uh, as of now. And uh, I stress that this does not imply any, uh, any mixing or, uh, or ergodicity. And uh, there are quite a few applications. So first, of course, there are the Bernoulli measures that we talked about. And for, for this, it's, it's just an equality. There is no need for the, the constants or anything. Uh, then it also works for uh, irreducible Markov chains, as we have just uh, discussed. That, that's what we had in mind when we introduced uh, the Xi. Um, 
It also works for Gibbs measure on subshifts that satisfy some specification property. And then, then again, this Xi comes very naturally from the, uh, the specification property. And uh, it also works for Gibbs states in, in, uh, in, the, in statistical mechanics, if we consider absolutely summable uh, interactions. And, um, and so, so this is actually where these uh, decoupling conditions first uh, uh, appeared in the, in the literature. And uh, here, if we look at that, we might think that this is all very Gibson, and this is this is true. But it turns out that these assumptions are also satisfied for some very uh, non Gibson uh, measures, in the sense that uh, that the, the the marginals here uh, may decay super exponentially without being uh, without vanishing. And so this is what happens, for example, in some examples that that we've worked on with uh, uh, Tristan Benoit, uh, Volkenia Kshitsch, and Claude Alain Pillet um, about uh, repeated quantum measurement uh, uh, processes. And this is what motivated us to to study such uh, such decoupling conditions. And so uh, we're going to uh, to assume this now. And um, and so now, in order to start proving large deviation principles for our return time, we first need a result, which is an LDP. Uh, for the uh, the SMB theorem, because we're going to need this theorem in order to prove the large deviation principle for the return times, and also the rate function that we obtain here for the SMB theorem will be used to compute the rate function for our return times. So this is a theorem that we proved with uh, with Volkan Yakshitz, Claude Alampier, and Armand Shirikian a few years ago, and it's an LDP for the this sequence here, which is the sequence which appears in the uh, in the SMB theorem. And so uh, under these decoupling conditions, it satisfies the uh, LDP with a convex rate function, uh, ISMB. So for this talk, we're just going to take ISMB as, a, as, as given. And all we need to know is that it's a convex rate function. Uh, but it turns out that in many, many examples, we can actually compute this um, ISMB rate function explicitly. So this is really uh, to be seen as a friendly uh, object. And, uh, and we can also define a, a pressure associated to this uh, SMB theorem by taking here the limit of 1 over n times the, the, the cumulant generating function associated to this, um, to this, uh, this uh, random variable here. And this is actually, I mean, the limit exists here, and it's given by the Legendre transform of ISMB here. And since everything is convex, we can invert the Legendre transform, and we get that ISMB is also the Legendre transform of the SMB uh, pressure. So we have perfect Legendre duality, which gives very nice uh, pictures. And so now I will uh, draw uh, an example of, uh, I, uh, of a rate function for the SMB theorem here. And we really need to understand this, uh, this function uh, very well, because then uh, we will actually draw the, um, the rate functions for our return times on, on top of this one. And we will see that they coincide in some intervals, but not um, everywhere. So here, I, we actually drew, drew a, a, an easy, a simple case of a, of a Bernoulli uh, measure. So everything is very smooth, very nice. Um, the, the P's are gothic. And, and here we see that the rate function vanishes at, at uh, precisely the, the entropy of, uh, of P, which is not surprising because in this ergodic case, we have almost true convergence to this, um, this value. So the probability to be around here uh, tends to one. So of course the rate function has to be a zero. There is no exponential decay. And the other thing that we see, uh, is, sorry, and uh, in the non-ergodic case, it might very well happen that the rate function vanishes on, a, on an interval here. So this gives uh, uh, pictures which are not as pretty, but, but still the result uh, works and there is absolutely no problem with, uh, with uh, the rate function vanishing on an interval. And, uh, and the other thing that we see is that the rate function is, is finite here and actually jumps to, uh, to infinity outside this uh, interval, which is given by these values, uh, gamma plus and gamma minus. So gamma plus is the limit of one over n times the logarithm of the probability of the most likely word of length uh, uh, n. And gamma minus is the same thing where we restrict the infimum to, to words which have a strictly positive um, probability. And so gamma plus and gamma, gamma minus give us some exponential bounds on the rate of decay of the probability of the, uh, the cylinders in a way. And, and so it's not a surprise that the rate function is infinite outside of this interval, because if we take some point here, uh, then by definition of gamma plus, uh, eventually the probability to be uh, here uh, is zero. And so it decays super exponentially. So the rate function has to be infinite. And so now if we look at, uh, at uh, the pressure, there is much less to say. Uh, we just have a nice uh, increasing uh, function. Uh, it is convex and it vanishes at the, uh, at the origin. 
So again, this is really a, a starting point. And now, uh, for those of you who like to think in terms of dynamical systems, I would like to stress that this uh, this theorem and this uh, th this large deviation principle is actually pretty standard in in the framework of uh, of dynamical systems. If we consider some uh, uh, the case where p is a Gibbs measure for some potential uh, phi which uh, I will assume has vanishing topological pressure, because then in this uh, in this case, we can actually uh, compute that ISMB is just S minus the the, the, the largest uh, kolmogorov sinai entropy among all invariant probability measures, such that the integral of the potential uh, is given by minus S. And then the, the SMB pressure can be computed by taking the topological pressure of one minus alpha times phi, and these two things are related by a Legend transform, as one can see by the, the standard uh, variation principle for a dynamical system. So, so this is really a, a known uh, grounds and known ground in in, uh, in many cases. Okay, so so now let's turn to the return times for our uh, um, the, <coughs> sorry. Let's turn to the uh, large deviation principle for our return times. So we start with Vn, which is the one uh, where we, we forbid uh, uh, overlaps, which makes things a little bit easier. Um, so we have proved that uh, 1 over n times the logarithm of Vn here satisfies the large deviation principle with a convex rate function uh, V of s, which is given by the following formula. So for negative values of s, it is infinite. And this is no surprise because this quantity is always uh, non-negative. So, so the probability to be negative is zero and the rate function has to be infinite. And for positive values of s, it's given by this formula here, which involves uh, ISMB. And so we will see what this gives on the, on the drawing in a, in a minute. It's, it's uh, quite simple to, to, to draw, actually. And we can also introduce the, the pressure QV that's uh, associated to this, uh, this uh, VN uh, random variable. And once again, this, uh, this pressure exists. And it can be expressed in terms of the uh, SMB uh, pressure. We get the maximum of QSMB of alpha and QSMB of uh, minus one. And again, this is the Legendre transform of the uh, the rate function. And since everything is convex, we have perfect Legendre uh, duality between the rate function and the, and the, and the, um, the pressure. So, so this is a convenient situation. And so now we can go back to the drawing. So I just repeat, I'm repeating the formulas here for, uh, for the, the rate function and the pressure. And so here we had this uh, ISMB rate function. And if we draw this uh, function here, IV on top of that, uh, we obtain something like that. So we see that there is uh, some point here. And this point is actually the point where the, the green curve has a slope uh, that is minus one. And to the right of this point, the two, uh, the two rate functions uh, coincide, which means that at the uh, level of large deviations, we have the, the same fluctuations in this region. And then uh, left from this point, the rate function for IV just uh, goes like a, like a straight line here, and then it's, it jumps to infinity, which means that we actually have more fluctuations here uh, if we take these return times. Um, and so if we now uh, want to look at the, at the pressure here, it's not hard to see that if we draw this function here, we just uh, follow the pressure all the way up to minus one, and then we, we are just constant here, and this Q star is just a shorthand to say QSME of minus one. And this has an explicit formula if we if we take the exponential of the logarithm in the formula, which is the limit of 1 over n times the logarithm of the sum of the square of the probabilities of all words of length n. And this is easily shown to be uh, smaller than uh, than this uh, this gamma plus that we had before. So so the the order of these points here is uh, is is exactly as on the on the drawing, and this will play uh, an important role in a in a minute. So this is for uh, this is for Vn, and so now uh, what changes for Rn? So that's when we start uh, allowing for overlaps, and uh, as we have uh, said at, at the beginning, uh, Vn and Rn are different only in the case where Rn is smaller than n, uh, and this is because Rn allows for for such uh, overlaps, and so when Rn is uh, smaller than n, then clearly one over n times the logarithm of Rn uh, goes to zero. And so we expect that actually these, these overlaps only contribute to the rate function at, the, at, at zero, because this goes to zero. And this is indeed what we're going to obtain. So the theorem goes as follow. Uh, we, actually, we actually need an extra assumption. We need to assume that for every uh, positive delta, 
there exists a periodic sequence X, such that if we take the limb inf of one over N times the logarithm of the probability uh, of X one N, then this is bounded below by gamma plus minus delta. So this gamma plus is related to the most likely word of length N. And, uh, and so what we're saying here is that we can sort of approximate the uh, very likely words by, by taking some periodic uh, sequences. So it turns out that this assumption is necessary in, uh, in our, uh, is important in our proof. We were not able to get rid of it. It does not seem to follow from our other decoupling assumptions, but also we are completely unable to find any example which satisfies the decoupling assumptions and not this, uh, this assumption here. So, so it's actually not a, not a big problem in, in, in practice. And so under this uh, additional assumption, um, then, uh, then one over n log of R n satisfies a large deviation principle with a rate function that is a modification of IV. So for all the non-zero values of S, this is just given by uh, IV. And at the origin, it changes and it's given by minus gamma plus. So this is as we expect, it only changes at the origin. And I stress that this expression here is not uh, convex in, in general. We will see it on the, on the drawings. And, uh, and so we can again uh, define a pressure function, QR of uh, alpha, by taking the, 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 the usual uh, limit of 1 over n times the, uh, the, the cumulant generating function. And so again, this has a formula in terms of, uh, of the SMB quantities here. This is the maximum of QSMB of alpha and gamma plus. And again, this is the Legendre transform of the rate function. But now this time, we do not have that uh, the rate function is the Legendre transform of the pressure because again, uh, we are not uh, convex. So now we can we can go back to the to the drawing. So again, these are the formulas that we uh, that we just had, and here I'm just recalling the definitions of uh, Q star and uh, gamma plus, which we which we have here. And so now, if we add on top of this drawing where we had uh, in green the SMB uh, rate function and in orange the uh, rate function for VN, then we add the the rate function for uh, RN. All we do is that we take the orange one and we just pull one point down. So of course this makes the rate function uh, non-convex, except in the in the kind of marginal case where these two points uh, coincide, and we will see that this is actually a, a quite degenerate uh, um, situation. And so if we look at the pressure, then uh, if we plot QR of alpha, then it, it, nothing very interesting happens. We just saturate here at uh, at the value uh, gamma plus. So this is now the, the complete pictures for our rate functions and, uh, and pressures. And now I think is the right time to compare with the results of, uh, of uh, Abadi, Amorim, Chazot, and, uh, and Gallo. Uh, because the, the picture on the right here appears exactly like that in, in their paper. And the, their strategy is that they, they actually work to, to prove that, uh, that we have such, uh, such relations between the, the pressures. And then they use some local version of the uh, Gartner and Delis theorem in order to, to derive the, uh, the, uh, the large deviation principle for the, uh, for the return times. And uh, the problem is that the, the, the Gartner and theorem actually, actually requires some um, differentiability. And here, uh, if you take QSMB, then under uh, the assumptions that, that they have, this QSMB is, uh, is uh, smooth. Uh, but of course, then uh, QV and QR, uh, as one clearly see, there is some uh, some singularities here, so so they are not uh, differentiable. Uh, but still, uh, one can use some local version of Gartner and Ellis to get a local large deviation principle uh, to for, for all the points here which are in Legendre duality with uh, with these points here where the pressures are differentiable. And so in the end, we obtain a, a, an L, they, they obtain an LDP uh, that works in, in this interval here where, where all the rate functions uh, coincide. And the problem with uh, Gartner Ellis is that then it's completely blind to, uh, to, to what happens here in this region where the three rate functions are, uh, are distant because of these uh, non-differentiability uh, here. And in a way, our strategy goes the opposite direction because we start by working at the LDP level. And uh, we prove the LDP with the, uh, the non-convex rate function. And uh, only then we use the LDP to, to, to derive some uh, expressions for the, the pressures. And so this allows us to see the, the, this, this interesting uh, region here. 
And, uh, and also actually under our assumption, the, the QSMB here is not, uh, is not uh, differentiable in general. So, so even in this, uh, in this region, we would not be able to, uh, to uh, apply uh, Gartner and Ellis under um, our uh, assumptions. So this is the the um, so this is the situation, and now I would like to uh, to go through a very simple example just to to try to understand uh, what happens in this uh, in this uh, in this region here. So if we look at uh, the simplest case that that's just Bernoulli measures, and I'm going to to take the, the simplest simplest case, which is uh, just the case of a binary shift. So we take a product measure. And uh, at each, uh, for each site, we just toss a coin, toss a coin, and with probability p, we get one, and with probability one minus p, we get a zero. And so we're going to assume without loss of generality that uh, that p is uh, is uh, larger than one half. Uh, otherwise, we just flip uh, zero and, and one. And then it's very easy to compute uh, the uh, the Kolmogorovs in I entropy. That's just the entropy of the uh, of the dis distribution on each side, because when you uh, you take the logarithm and divide by n, then everything factors out and the n's uh, cancel out, and you don't even need to take a limit. Uh, in the same way, it's easy to compute gamma plus, because the most likely word of length n is just a sequence of uh, n ones in a, in a row, which has probability p n. So again, when we take the logarithm and divide by n, we just get log of uh, log of p here. Uh, and again, we can compute q star explicitly, uh, and it's given by this this explicit uh, formula here. And uh, as the theory says, gamma plus is always larger or equal to gamma uh, to to q star. And here we easily see on these formulas that we have equality if and only if p is either one half or, or one. And uh, and actually, there is also the case where p is equal to zero. But but again, we are assuming here that we take uh, p larger than than one half, so we discard this case. Um, and so these are clearly some some cases which are degenerate in a in a way. So so let's see uh, uh, what happens that they are degenerate in a, in a slightly different way. So the the most degenerate case is when p is equal to one, because then the whole measure p collapses to to one point, which is the uh, the, the the periodic orbit uh, which is just uh, made of of uh, ones and then the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy is uh, vanishing and almost surely rn is equal to one vn is equal to n and uh, one over n log of pn is equal to zero so there are absolutely no fluctuations of any of the quantities of interest here so this is really a, 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 a trivial uh, a situation uh, but still there is no there is no problem with it uh, per se and uh, we get a large deviation principle with rate functions which are all uh, convex and they they actually all coincide and they they are just they vanish at the origin and they are infinite everywhere else so I, not very interesting situation um the second case uh, the second degenerate case is much more interesting that's when p is equal to one half because then uh, if we look at the smb uh, observable here then it is always equal to log of two, which is also uh, the, the the entropy here. And again, gamma plus is equal to Q star, which is equal to uh, log of two, uh, which means that the rate function uh, IR is equal to IV and, and thus it is convex. So if we look at the drawings, then ISMB, since there are absolutely no fluctuations for this quantity, ISMB vanishes at log of two and it's infinite everywhere else. And now if we draw uh, IV and IR, we see that they, they are just given by this segment here. And so this is perfectly fine. We, we indeed have fluctuations for the return times, and they are given by this, uh, this, uh, this rate function. And again, uh, both rate functions are convex, and this is uh, slightly degenerate. And here uh, we can see the, the corresponding uh, pressures. And again, there is uh, the, the, the pressures for V and R uh, coincide. And so finally, we can move to the generic case, which is when P is strictly between one half and, and, and one. And in this case, IR is, uh, is non-convex. And actually, uh, this is the graphs I've been showing you uh, from the start. They correspond to the case where P is equal to 0 0.7. So really the, the message is that in the generic case, the rate function is, uh, is non-convex. And so now uh, what I'd like to do is try to understand a little bit better what's, what's going on with these, uh, these values here. Because here what we're seeing is that the, 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 the rate function for Rn is smaller, which, mean that it's, which means that it's much more likely to have a, 
uh, very small values of, uh, of our return time in terms of Rn. And again, this is not a surprise because we're allowing for overlaps. So, so of course, we, we are going to have a higher probability to find the small values. But we can actually guess these values by some very naive uh, uh, computation, which turns out gives us the, the right answer from the start. So very naively, we can try to compute the probability that Rn is uh, equal to, to the, the smallest value that it can take, which is 1. And uh, so if Rn is equal to 1, it means that we just have n plus 1 times the same, uh, the same symbol, because they have to repeat uh, immediately. And so there are two possibilities. E either we just have n plus 1 ones, or we have n plus 1 zeros. And so the probability of that is p to the uh, n plus 1 plus 1 minus p to the n plus 1. And so since we're assuming that p is, uh, is uh, strictly larger than 1 half, this one is negligible. So we basically get p to the power n here, or in other words, uh, the exponential of n log of p, which is exponential of n gamma plus, which is, again, exponential of minus n times the rate function at, uh, at 0. So of course, we're just taking one possible values among all those that contributes to the rate function at the origin. But we see that already here, we get the, the, the right scaling at the exponential uh, uh, scale. And if we consider all the other terms that contributes to the rate function at zero, we see that they actually give basically the same probability and uh, they, they come in a sub-exponential number. So, so then this does not give any, uh, any uh, additional uh, contribution at the exponential scale. And so now just to compare, we can look at, uh, at uh, Vn. Uh, and so we can compute the probability that Vn takes the smallest possible value, which is just n. Uh, and so if Vn is equal to n, it just means that we, we see th that the first n symbols are actually the same as the next uh, n symbols. So we can just sum over all words of length uh, n and take uh, the probability of u, u. And uh, since uh, everything is uh, independent here, uh, since we have a Bernoulli measure, then this is just the square of the probability of u. And then again, this is uh, exactly that there is, this is not even an, an asymptotic relation. It's really an exact relation. This is e to the n times q star, which is equal to e to the minus n times iv of zero. So, uh, so again, very naive computations, but we sort of understand where, where these terms come from. And in a way, uh, the probability here is much larger than this one. And the way when one can understand that is, is to say that here, in order to have Rn equals to one, we, we, we have some constraint on uh, n plus one symbols. So basically n symbols. And here we actually need some constraint on, uh, on two n symbols. So this is much more uh, costly in terms of uh, probability in a way. But now in the second case, we're also allowed to sum over uh, many, many terms. And here we just have uh, two n, and actually only one uh, matters. But it turns out that in the non-degenerate case, uh, the fact that we have many terms in the sum here does not allow to compensate for the fact that here we, we just have a, a constraint over n terms. And so in the end, uh, this, uh, this probability wins uh, at, the, uh, at the exponential scale. So now uh, we can ask about uh, more complicated uh, examples. And again, the picture is that we get a convex rate function only in the degenerate cases. So, uh, so first we can consider irreducible Markov chains. Uh, and then uh, actually gamma plus is, easily, uh, is easy to compute because one just has to look at the most likely cycle on our Markov chain. And, uh, and we can, it's sufficient to consider cycles which are no larger than the size, the size of the alphabet. So, so that's explicitly known uh, in any um, explicit situation. And, uh, and then we get that the rate function for Rn is convex if and only if P is the measure of maximal entropy, so the Parry measure, on the Markov subshifts that's generated uh, by our Markov chain, which means that given the constraint uh, of which transitions are allowed and, and which are not, uh, our measure has to be uh, as close as possible to the, uh, to the, to the uniform one. Uh, in order to have a, a convex uh, a rate function for Rn. And so to, to take a more general situation, we can consider equilibrium measures. So that is the case that was considered in the, in the previous papers. And uh, so then if we take an equilibrium measure for a potential uh, uh, phi uh, with uh, summable uh, variations, and, and for simplicity, I will assume that the uh, topological uh, uh, pressure of phi uh, vanishes here. 
Uh, then, as we have seen before, we have explicit formulas for ISMB and QSMB in terms of the uh, of the variational principle and the um, and the topological uh, uh, pressure here. And um, and also we can compute gamma plus. Uh, gamma plus is is just the supremum over all invariant uh, uh, probability measures of the integral of the uh, potential with respect to the the, the, the invariant measure eta. And Q star can be computed as, as uh, the, the, the topological pressure of uh, twice the potential phi. And so then one, what one can show is that IR is convex if and only if uh, phi is, uh, is equal to a constant up to some, uh, some co-boundary uh, terms. So, so again, we have a very uh, degenerate uh, situation here. And if you want to think in terms of subshifts, um, then IR is convex if and only if P is the measure of maximal entropy on the on the subshift under uh, investigation. So uh, so again, this is very uh, very degenerate. Okay, so now in the in the next in the last uh, perhaps ten minutes, what I would like to do is is try to to give you a, a hint of how the the proof works. Uh, so, so we can start with uh, with Vn. So again, this is the uh, easiest uh, case, and then we will see what uh, what changes if we look at uh, Rn. And so, the key for the proof is some kind of a, a geometric approximation. And so, the, the the idea is the following: Let's say that we want to compute the uh, probability that Vn is equal to some value k uh, with k larger than n, uh, given that the the first n symbols are uh, given by some word u, which, which we fix uh, once and for all. Then the idea of the approximation, the geometric approximation is to say that this can be approximated in a way by some, uh, some geometric random variable uh, with parameter p n of u. And so the, the idea behind that is the following. Let, let's say that we look, we're looking at a sequence here and the first symbols are given by uh, u. Uh, then what we want to do is look if there is uh, some u appearing here. And if yes, then we have our, our first return and we are done. And if not, then we look one step to the right. And again, we look whether there is u here. And if, uh, if we find u, uh, we call it a success. And if not, we try again uh, one step to the right. So, so in a way, we sort of have a sequence of, uh, of trials. And at each trial, we look if there is one u. And, uh, and our return time is the time of the first success in a way. So if we think in these terms, it's not uh, completely crazy to, to believe that this will look like a geometric random variable with, with the probability of success, which is just Pn of u. And then, uh, then uh, if the first success appears after, n, uh, after k attempts, then we have one minus Pn. So that's the probability of uh, missing u uh, to the power uh, k minus n. But of course, it cannot be so because uh, because that, that would be true if we assume that all the atoms are are independent, and of course they are not. I mean, first of all, we are uh, we are uh, conditioning on on the first n symbols, so then this of course affects the distribution of the remainder of the of the sequence. Uh, but th this is uh, well handled by by our uh, decoupling uh, assumptions. And um, but the, the real problem is is actually that uh, subsequent attempts are, are all but independent, even in the Bernoulli case, because the, because subsequent attempts will share a, a lot of symbols, uh, so 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 they really affect each uh, each other. But it turns out that uh, that one can still prove something that goes in the direction of this uh, geometric approximation. Um, and th there is a whole literature about proving uh, such approximations for uh, dynamical systems. And usually it's called uh, the, uh, the exponential uh, approximations because the, the scaling and the mindset is, is somewhat different. And, uh, and, and in this literature, uh, people usually uh, assume some very strong form of, uh, of mixing, and then they get some very sharp uh, versions of this geometric approximations where the probability of success has to be, uh, has to be uh, adapted uh, in, uh, in a way. And so in our case, we don't have mixing. So we had to actually prove some version of this geometric approximation under our decoupling assumptions. And, and we, of course, we get something that is much looser because our assumptions are, are much looser than, than mixing. And so actually, I'm just flashing here the, the two uh, inequalities that, that we're 
able to prove after a lot of uh, technical uh, uh, computations. So we have to 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 put gaps between uh, attempts to to use the decoupling assumptions, and then we have to take union bounds and uh, and uh, complements. Uh, uh, at a lot of places, as, as one can sh as one can see by all this one minus uh, something here. So this is kind of tedious, but the idea is that for all intents and purposes, once we have these approximations, we can re really use them as if we had these uh, th th this uh, geometric approximation here. So if we're okay with that, I, I would like to cheat a little bit now, and and just pretend that this approximation uh, makes sense. And uh, and then go along with this uh, this approximation and and actually the actual proof works uh, if we take the more complicated uh, uh, estimates that I just showed you. So uh, we want to focus only on positive values of uh, s because as we've seen when s is negative, uh, then uh, one over n log of v n um, has no probability to be there, so there is just nothing to say. And so uh, let's try to compute the probability that one over n times the logarithm of Vn belongs to some small ball around uh, some value s. And so here I want to take epsilon very small, and, and then of course we have to take limits in the uh, in the uh, in the correct uh, order. But let's not uh, worry about that. The point is that uh, in terms of uh, n, when epsilon is small enough, this scales like e to the minus n s. So this is some kind of Jacobian because we want to to somehow take the exponential of uh, of the uh, of the ball uh, in in a way, and so this is this scales like e to the minus e to the n s times the probability that v n is equal to uh, some value e to the n s. And so now uh, we want to use this approximation. So we want to condition on on u. So we we sum. Uh, over all uh, possible values of the first n symbols here, u, and then we take p n of u times the probability that we that we had here. So we get a squared here, and then this uh, this uh, one minus p n of u to the power uh, e to the n s. So that's the k that we had here minus n, and of course we will uh, neglect the uh, the minus n here uh, in comparison with this uh, with this exponential. And now something really uh, really interesting happens because. Pn is is going to be small, so so here we have some uh, one minus Pn, which is close to one, but we take a very large power of it, so there is a very short uh, cutoff uh, phenomenon that takes place, and actually, if uh, if Pn is uh, is um, is small, then basically this can be replaced by one, and if Pn is uh, is large, then uh, then this decays super exponentially, so actually we can restrict this sum up to some some super exponentially decaying error term which which we can easily neglect uh then this it only uh, it suffices to to consider the sums over all the u's whose probability is smaller than e to the minus n s and then this uh, this parenthesis here is replaced by one so we just have a have this like that and so now uh what we can do is that we can rewrite this as an integral on the real line by introducing mu n, uh, the distribution of minus one over n log of p n. So if we rewrite this uh, this sum here, we just get the integral from s to infinity because of all the the the, the minuses that that we have uh, uh, here, and then we get e to the minus r n. So this was one of our uh, p n's here, and then the other one goes into the the measure here, which is uh, d mu n of r. And now we have to to recall that we have a large deviation principle for uh, for this quantity here because uh, this one minus n log of p n that is precisely the uh, the quantity that satisfies the LDP in the SMB uh, LDP that I uh, I told you about and so this quantity uh, formally can be thought of as being like e to the minus n times i SMB of r dr so of course all of this has to be made. Uh, made uh, precise and, uh, and and we do it very carefully in the in the paper but that's really uh, how it goes and so now uh, we have some uh, some integral of an exponential of n times uh, something that depends on on uh, r and so we can use the uh, the, the 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 principle of uh, laplace and uh, say that this scales like e to the n times the supremum of all what we had in the uh, in the exponential and this happens to be precisely the the rate function that we uh, that we introduced so again all the the steps here are, are quite a bit uh, hand waving but the actual proof really uh, follows this this path and in the end we get a fairly good understanding of this um, 
of this uh, uh, rate function here. And uh, the very important thing is this, this uh, cutoff uh, that, that happens uh, here. Okay, so this, this was for uh, Vn. And now uh, what about uh, Rn? Uh, then, uh, as we have said before, uh, when S is uh, strictly positive, we have the same um, rate function. And actually, the same, uh, the same arguments really applies. We have to think to shift things a, a little bit, but uh, asymptotically, it's the exact same uh, arguments, so, so not uh, repeat it. And now, what's interesting is what happens at s uh, equals zero, because then we have to compute this uh, this rate function and, and show that this is given by minus gamma plus. And so the claim uh, that, uh, that that I want to to prove now is that the probability that one over n log of r n belongs to uh, to some small ball uh, around the origin is bounded below by e to the minus, uh, sorry, e to the n gamma plus, which is equal to e to the minus n times i r of zero. And again, we, we've seen it in, a, in an example with the, the Bernoulli uh, uh, shift, um, the, the, yeah, the, the Bernoulli measure before. And now I want to, to do the general case, which will uh, use our assumptions about periodic orbits. So uh, if we fix now some, uh, some periodic orbit x, and let's say that uh, x has a period uh, x, then it's easy to see that Rn of x is, uh, is no larger than p. And actually, if we take any other sequence y, such that the first n plus p symbols of, uh, of y coincide with the first n plus p symbols of x, then also Rn of y uh, is no larger than p, because actually you, you can tell if you have a return by just looking at the first n plus p uh, symbols here. So it doesn't depend on what uh, comes after. Uh, these uh, these symbols, and so uh, again, if we want to compute this uh, this quantity here, then when n is large enough, uh, this is bounded below by the probability that R n is uh, is uh, smaller or equal to p, because then when we take one over n log of that, then then we get something that is eventually in this uh, in this uh, ball here for a fixed uh, epsilon, and then but by what we have just said. This is bounded below by the probability that the sequences the sequence starts with uh, x one n plus p uh, with this periodic orbit x. And so now the assumption said that that we can precisely pick this uh, this uh, periodic orbit x in such a way that the probability here decays like uh, e to the n plus p times gamma plus minus uh, minus delta. And so basically we are done because now if we take the logarithm and divide by n, uh, when we take the limit in n, we can forget about the, the p that we have here. And then we send delta to zero and we get precisely the, the bound that we, uh, that we claimed here. So this, is, uh, this generalizes the, the, the proof that we had in the Bernoulli case because uh, when we looked at the proof, we considered the, the situation where, when we had uh, just a sequence of ones. And so this was actually a periodic orbit of uh, period one. So this is really the, the natural uh, generalization of the, uh, of the argument. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Noe, for this, uh, this very interesting talk. Thank you. We have uh, time for questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself, or if you prefer, you can write the question in the chat. Can I ask one question? It seems like you are restricted to one-dimensional systems, but it should not matter at all. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, so actually, uh, this is this is something we've discussed with uh, also Jean Jean Anish Hazot, and um, and in, indeed we expect that that we can do it in a, in higher uh, dimension. Uh, but now, I mean, it's not so clear what you do with these decoupling assumptions um, uh, because when when we have this word psi that we insert, then this generalizes in a, in a weird way in two dimension because because if you if you think of gluing rectangles together. Uh, they, then you, you, your joints have to be uh, consistent in in a way. So 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 you lose a little mm -hmm. bit of uh, of flexibility. But this is this is true that 
uh, that, that would certainly complicate the estimates uh, a bit, but we, we expect, I mean, there is nothing that's super specific to, to 1D. Uh, yes, you're right. But you, you could also look at the two dimensions, say, where you fix some directions and you just explore in one direction. Yes, that, that would be even, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I think that would work. Okay, can I ask a question? So is it possible that your assumption about the existence of periodic X, which has high probability, breaks down in some, some systems like with quasi-periodic or random potential or something like that? So we would be very interesting to find such a, a counterexample. We, we've really looked hard, but but somehow we are convinced that if we look at some very peculiar shifts that that uh, mm -hmm. that might be actually natural in some fields of dynamical systems, but we just don't know of them, uh, mm -hmm. th then we could find a counterexample. So if you know of any, I'm, I'm really interested of uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'm really interested to to discuss it, and if if you can send me some references, uh, because we'd be very happy to to be able to draw the line. Be, before or after this this uh, assumption somehow. And if this assumption does not hold, then do you expect some different behavior for this R? Yes. Uh, so so then um, then basically, I mean, if if you look at the at the proof, so so I cannot really write down uh, uh, here, but we see that there is actually one very specific part of the proof when we use the where we use this assumption and it's really at one specific point and you can you could sort of replace uh, the estimates that we get by some other estimates if you have some other means of uh, of proving that um but but we so, so we actually discussed this in a in in a remark but we were not able to find any uh, any situation where where we have a, concretely something to to win by considering a more general assumption so so yes this is kind of a loose end thank you Are there any other questions uh, well maybe let me ask a question um can you say a few words uh, about the motivation uh, for this work? For example, you mentioned repeated quantum measurements. Can you say a bit more about it? I mean, physical motivation. Okay, so so then uh, this was a um, so this was a motivation for the uh, for the decoupling uh, assumptions, uh, not necessarily for uh, uh, for the study of return times, but it also. Uh, it also applies to, uh, to 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 that, and so the idea is that when when you consider some uh, so so you consider physical systems and and then uh, you you let it evolve and then you do some measurement on it which might or might not be a projective uh, measurement, uh -huh. and uh, and then uh, every time you do a measurement you you assume that this measurement takes values in a in a finite set which is our alphabet, and then you forget about the whole quantum system that's uh, that, that's that's behind and you only keep track of the symbols that you get. So each time you have a measurement you get a symbol, and so then you look at the probability distribution of this. Uh, of the symbols, and it turns out that they satisfy this uh, this decoupling uh, assumptions. And so now, if you have a, if you want to study the the the, um, the local entropy or the actually the the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy in the ergodic case of the the sequence that you obtain from this uh, this physical measurements, then you can look at these uh, return times um, indeed. And uh, and then there are many many variants. I mean, in, in the paper with uh, with uh, Tristan and uh, Claude Alain and Volcan, we do a lot of uh, uh, so, so we have these two time measurements processes. We have uh, von Neumann. We have a lot of, of different uh, physical situations in, in which we uh, we're able to 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 show that these decoupling assumptions uh, actually work. But but then they are. If if you ask about the really the physical uh, applications, then then they are much more specialized uh, than me. Uh, I mean, my co-authors are much more specialized than me in the oh. physical uh, aspect of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? It doesn't seem to be the case, and we're abutting on uh, on the end of our hour. So thank you so much, Noe, for this uh, this wonderful talk, and thank you all for for coming. Uh, we will be back uh, in two weeks for the next seminar, and we we hope to see you there. Thank you.